as I said, um, please use that chat function to also let us know where you're coming from. We'd really want to know what rivers you're concerned about, what communities you're working with, what struggles you're going through. So please share that and we'll build that as part of our community going forward. So without further ado, um, what, what I'll do now is just move to the action and the fundraiser as a bit of a teaser and I'll come to this more later. Our action that we'll have is we're really trying to use this opportunity to, to initiate a global call, a petition for action in this time of crisis. We want to build out a, a voice for realising a, a, a strong and a different future for our rivers. This is a real chance where we can see and act on a, on a different future. We've been you know, pushing and pushing and pushing a long time, often against dams or extraction of water, and there's a lot of pushback, but now with COVID, we see that there's opportunities. Financing is needing to be thinking differently about the type of investments they're making for energy. And there's real opportunities there to, to envisage differently. So we'll look at an action and we'll take you into that. And hopefully you can then expand that out through your networks as well. And the other part just that we'll be doing as well as coming to a fundraising ask, we've had a very generous anonymous donation uh, for a matching grant. We've had $30,000 put up to challenge us to, to match uh, another $30,000. So we'll be able to realize $60,000 towards our mission if we can achieve that 30,000 target by the end of this month. We're already on the way to that and we'll talk more about that uh, in, in, in a little while but we will offer you a chance to dig deeply and to help us in our mission. So with all that framing uh, and, and introduction from me, I'd like to now move over to ask our, our resident poet, our long friend, Jane Hirschfield, to speak. Um, I'll, I'll introduce Jane now with a bit more um, nuance. Jane is someone I still haven't met face to face. Jane has been uh, going to speak to our, uh, our, our sessions uh, over the last year, but last year we were planning a, a, a meeting in the Bay Area together. And unfortunately, again, linked to climate change and the context that our rivers are facing, we had the extreme of the fires that swept through Southern California and we had to cancel that event. So we couldn't, I couldn't meet Jane, we couldn't hear from her there, but she's very kindly agreed to come on to this webinar when we couldn't meet face to face again because of COVID-19. So Jane, many of you will know, but I'll introduce her. She's a internationally renowned and many times awarded poet. Uh, she's a poet, an essayist, and a long friend of International Rivers. Jane is going to read today from some of her latest work in her most recent book just released called Ledger. Uh, and we will know, uh, we'll give you a, um, a connection for how you can get that book uh, at, the end of, at the end of the session. Jane's book Ledger with her recent poetry actually is dealing with the crises that are facing the biosphere and particularly looking at the connection between biosphere and social justice issues that are so pertinent in so many places around the world, but particularly in the States today. Um, some of you might have heard Jane when she read um, at the March for Science in DC back in 2017, where she read on the fifth day her, her poem looking at the importance of facts and the importance of science and the threats that some of our current author authoritarian regimes are placing on those essential uh, parts of our civil society. Um, when I heard that poem and, and had a chance to reread it in preparation for here, I couldn't think of a more apt uh, entry into what we're trying to look at today with the context of COVID. So now more than ever, as we need science and facts in our life, uh, the chance to hear from Jane and hear her poetry, hear the connection between art and community 
art and science, art and struggle, I think will be a, a, a very rewarding time for us. So without further ado, Jane, I'm going to hand over to you to, to read for us. And thank you so much for joining us again. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It is a hallmark, I think, of International River's extraordinary um, devotion to the full picture that they would choose to bring poetry in to this webinar. And I'm very grateful for that. So I'm just going to read you a few poems to start and then oh, one at the very end. I will begin with the poem on the fifth day. Uh, the reference for those of you who may not know it, the fifth day of the current administration in America was the day that all climate change information was taken down from the White House website. And perhaps even more shockingly, every scientist who works for the federal government was told that they could not speak of their research in public without prior authorization. I have many friends who are research scientists. I was stunned on their behalf. And by the end of that day, I had written this poem. On the fifth day. On the fifth day, the scientists who studied the rivers were forbidden to speak or to study the rivers. The scientists who studied the air were told not to speak of the air. And the ones who worked for the farmers were silenced and the ones who worked for the bees. Someone from deep in the badlands began posting facts. The facts were told not to speak and were taken away. The facts, surprised to be taken, were silent. Now it was only the rivers that spoke of the rivers and only the wind that spoke of its bees, while the unpausing factual buds of the fruit trees continued to move toward their fruit. The silence spoke loudly of silence, and the rivers kept speaking of rivers, of boulders, and air. Bound to gravity, earless and tongueless, the untested rivers kept speaking. Bus drivers, shelf stockers, code writers, machinists, accountants, lab techs, cellists kept speaking. They spoke the fifth day of silence. This next poem was written in 2014, which was, I had written about environmental matters uh, ever since the first Earth Day happened in 1970, which I was a young, wide-eyed attendee at. But around 2014, uh, the crisis of the biosphere stepped forward in a newly urgent way. And this poem came from that. It's a poem of warning, a poem of imagining uh, the worst in the future and how the future might judge us for that. But it's also a poem whose hope is that it might make itself, by its own saying, by its own act of warning, something unneeded, something obsolete, that someday people might look back on this poem and say, she was so worried. She didn't need to be so worried. Uh, so in that way, this poem is also a poem, I suppose, of hope. Let them not say. Let them not say, we did not see it. We saw. Let them not say, we did not hear it. We heard. Let them not say, they did not taste it. We ate. We trembled. Let them not say it was not spoken, not written. We spoke, we witnessed with voices and hands. Let them not say they did nothing. We did not enough. Let them say as they must say something, a kerosene beauty, it burned. Let them say we warmed ourselves by it, read by its light, praised and it burned. So I think in order to let us get to um, the more particular parts of this webinar, I'll read you only one more relatively short poem. Um, it is a poem 
of in some way what's now become broadly known as the butterfly effect. Uh, that one never knows uh, what small thing will have what repercussion and consequence. Uh, it's a poem of perplexity and a poem of choice. And I did see what it describes actually uh, for no reason I could tell happen. No wind, no rain. No wind, no rain. The tree just fell as a piece of fruit does. But no, not fruit, not ripe, not fell. It broke, it shattered. One cone's addition of resinous cell sap, one small bodied bird arriving to tap for a beetle. It shattered. What word, what act was it we thought did not matter? Thank you very much. Michael, I think you're on mute. I am on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I, that must have looked very strange for people. I was saying in such a big webinar, we can't have applause, but we do this at International Rivers for applause. So um, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone else that those, uh, those words, the, the inspiration that people can take from poetry and the arts right now, it has been so richly coming through, I think, for all of us. So thank you, Jane, for teeing us up that way. And we'll hear from Jane again at the end. So um, thanks, Jane, for kicking us in. Um, what I'd like to do is quickly shift across. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists. We have two of our longer serving staff uh, to speak to the, the questions that we posed earlier. Uh, Monte Agre has been our longest serving staff with us for well over 20 years now. She uh, is deeply invested in our Latin America programming from Chile through Colombia, Mexico in the past, Peru, and deeply working on our river protections. Uh, Pai Ditis is from our Thai and Mekong program. Many of you will know Pai and Monty well from their work over, over many years. Uh, Pai particularly has been working on the Mekong uh, in, the, in the northern regions of Thailand for many, many years, connecting with communities and also more recently, um, but also over a long time, working to keep one of Asia's last free flowing rivers, free flowing the Salween, uh, which runs from China down through Myanmar and Thailand. So we'll be hearing from Pai and Monty, but before I hand over to them and ask them some questions, the latest piece of exciting news is many of you will know I've been standing in in the interim director role for, for over a year now. The board of directors has been running a, a recruitment process to build, bring in a, our next new leader, our next executive director. And it's my pleasure to introduce Daryl Knudsen today, who will be joining us from June 1. Daryl comes to us from a background in, river, uh, in, a background in rivers and, and uh, being a paddler on rivers, but professionally from a background in human rights, um, social justice and labour rights, uh, working on supply chain connections. So I'll introduce Daryl and, and ask him to share a little bit about who he is and uh, why he's joined us now. Daryl. All right, I was muted too. Well, thanks so much for the warm introduction, Michael. I am so delighted to be joining this storied organization, especially at this moment when our mission is more critical than ever. I'm immensely grateful, honored, more than a little humbled to be joining this powerful community of river advocates. And I do look forward to contributing my experiences and talents and perspectives to this impressive organization and this important movement. Like you, I feel a deep connection to rivers. I feel most alive when I am on rivers. And I've accumulated many cherished memories in 
on and alongside the water. I worked as a professional river guide for four years, and I've kayaked or otherwise paddled on over 125 rivers from the lush rainforests of Panama to the arid deserts of Utah in the United States. I've paddled with my wife, my children, who are watching, with my old friends and new ones. Outside the United States, I was privileged to travel along rivers with the Nassau people on the Rio Taribe in Panama more than 20 years ago. Laurel, if you have it handy, could you cue up the picture of my travel companions at that time? And more recently, to meet river communities on the Rio Marañón, the headwaters of the Amazon, this past December in Peru. And Laurel, if you could move to the pictures of the Marañón, where we see people who've written on their houses, no dams. All of these communities would be flooded out if the dams planned along their rivers were to be built. In fact, my experience with the Nassau people in Panama directly led to my pursuit of a career in business and human rights. But that's a longer story for another day. For now, suffice to say that as passionate as I am about rivers, I am equally passionate about human rights. During my work on human rights for factory workers in the global apparel industry, I've met a great many people who have risked their lives to speak up for what is right, to contribute to justice, fairness, and a cause greater than themselves. I know that river advocates, indeed many of you on this webinar, face equal risks. And some river advocates have also paid with their lives. To all of you, I am deeply grateful and I will seek to be a strong ally to you and your work. And we do have work, urgent work. We find ourselves in challenging times and we don't know what's around the next bend in the river. We do know that this global pandemic is creating direct menace for river advocates, dam affected peoples, and the rivers themselves, as we'll hear more about from Pai, Monty, Michael, and hopefully from some of you. These immediate threats are also occurring in the larger context of climate change, habitat destruction, economic and social hardship and inequities, and the alarming increase of widespread authoritarianism, all of which are creating existential threats to communities and river ecosystems alike. <laughs> Look, I've been in rooms, I've heard some people who wield considerable concentrated power describe themselves full of hubris as strong and durable and describe activists full of naivete as weak and controllable. But we know differently. Lao Tzu communicated great wisdom when he said the following about water. Water is fluid, soft, and yielding. But water will wear away rock, which is rigid and cannot yield. In all of my time on the water, I've learned that the river's power is unstoppable, given enough time. During my 20 years working on human rights, I've learned that the power of people-centered movements is unstoppable, given enough time. And I would suggest that our collective power as river advocates is unstoppable. And now is our time. Look at all the destructive dams that this community has already stopped together over the past 35 years. And think of all the 
healthy rivers and vibrant communities whose power we will help amplify going into the future. So yes, as a community, we have our work cut out for us, but we're clearly up for it. And we also have the uncommon opportunity to innovate toward a more just and sustainable world. I'm so, so grateful to all of our partners, to all of you for your partnership and support for this work in the past. I ask you to please continue that steadfast support into the future. If you're new to the movement, I know at least some of you are here because you know me after all, <laughs> I implore you to join us in this important work. And whether you're a new friend or an old one, I look forward to opportunities to get to know you better and what brings you to engage on these important issues and to partner with International Rivers. In the meantime, before we meet, I hope you're looking forward to today's conversation as much as I am. I know I will be learning a lot and I don't want to delay our panelists any longer from telling us about what they're seeing out there in the field. So back to you, Michael, to introduce Pai and Monty. Thanks, Daryl, and uh, really warm welcome to you. Uh, and look forward to meeting you one of these days in a post-COVID world as well, <laughs> uh, face to face. Uh, Daryl will be joining us from, from June 1 officially, so this is just a, a snapshot of uh, meeting our new executive director. Thanks again, Daryl. I'm not gonna, uh, we're already going, uh, fast into our time, so I don't want to tee this up much more other than to remind us what those three questions we're exploring are. We're looking at what are the impacts we're experiencing now uh, on our rivers with the communities that we work with in the context of COVID and their responses right now, but also what are the solutions? The second question will be what are the solutions that we're seeing? What are people doing right now and what are they positioning to do as we go forward? And then what are some actions we can take? So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Pai to share from the Mekong context, some of the impacts that we've been experiencing there. Over to you, Pai. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, I'd like to thank all attendees and friends and colleagues who joined this uh, evening's event. Uh, about the question number one, about what I'm seeing with the pandemic and impacts on the communities. I'd like to share a few points. One is the importance of river and natural resources base as a safety net during the time of the crisis. With the lockdown and economic fallout during the pandemic, many, many people, informal workers, laborers, taxi drivers, etc., have been returning from cities to rural areas. In time of crisis with no or less income, the forest, rivers, and wetlands, nature supermarket provide food and nutrients for these people, which are millions of people in the Mekong region. This is critical in countries in the Mekong region that have limited social safety nets available for the people affected by the pandemic and lockdown during this time. However, the ability of the Mekong and other major rivers to sustain communities is under threat. Decline in fish, natural resources are making life more difficult for many people living along the rivers. This situation has been increased due to extensive hydropower development in the Mekong Basin, both in upstream, in the upper reaches, as well as in the lower basin, which have destroyed fisheries, reduced productivity of local farmers and altered flow regime that people rely for livelihoods. Many people are already facing pressure and vulnerability due to displacement for dams. Uh, technician, can you show the photos that we prepared, please? Thank you very much. Many people already face pressure and vulnerability due to the displacement for dams and other large infrastructure projects. The situation is even more dire for this group. For example, recently the UN human rights expert recently raised the concern over ongoing difficult living conditions and food shortage that faced by villagers 
who lost their home and farmland in the Sapien Sinamnoi Dam collapse in Laos since 2018. Already for two years, they're still living in the temporary shelter and with the COVID-19 that even make their life more and more difficult. Next slide, please. The imp yeah, we have seen the impacts of the pandemic every corner of the world, but I would say that the impacts of this COVID-19 are uneven with marginalized groups most affected by the crisis. We see that the so-called development projects such as large dam on the Mekong River have in fact made life more unjustified. However, on the positive note, there is a strong solidarity between communities Recently, we see the current ethnic communities, including those in the Salawin Basin, which is one of the last international free flowing river that work to protect the Salawin River for the past 20 years, have been mobilizing and collecting rice that they just cultivate to donate to COVID affected communities in the southern part of Thailand. And there are more of this kind of stories. So I'm seeing the communities that organize strongly to protect themselves from facing large dam projects are using the same solidarity to protect their families and communities. And I'm seeing that these organized community are more stronger to cope with difficulties that they are facing. So Michael, this is the first part that I'd like to share and happy to hear from uh, participants if you have any questions. Thanks, Pai. We might we might hold uh, questions for now sure. in terms of uh, direct questions. But if people have questions or specific areas they'd like to hear more from Pai on, please do put put that in the chat box. We'll be hearing from Pai again, but uh, I'll hand over to Monty first to give a perspective from her direct work in Latin America. Monty. Thank you, Michael. Hello, everybody. I thank um, this community of river protectors and enthusiasts for coming together for this event. And I would like to begin by sharing three lines from the poem, How to Be a Poet by Wendell Berry. There are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. The meaning of these words are, are much in line with um, a deep sentiment about the work that we do and personally helps me focus, uh, keep the focus, especially in times of pandemia. Now, in reference to the uh, question, uh, impacts and challenges uh, in the Brazilian Amazon, things are really difficult. Illegal loggers, miners, and land grabbers are taking advantage of the coronavirus pandemic to intensify attacks on territories of indigenous peoples and other communities, sacking natural resources and spreading the virus to vulnerable groups. All this will reduce uh, with uh, reduced presence of enforcement agencies in the Brazilian Amazon. Also, the Bolsonaro government is attempting to proceed with construction of the Castanheira Dam on the Arenas River, very expensive project 140 megawatts of electricity back, provoking disastrous consequences for fish biodiversity and the livelihoods of indigenous peoples. Brazil is also uh, facing a severe backlog in environmental policies and governance. Environmental bodies such as IBAMA are being dismounted. And let's not forget the, the deforestation in the Amazon of, um, of April of this year and definitely last year, which was uh, this year, which was the highest in the last 10 years, including this deforestation included areas of indigenous lands and conservation units, deforestation and the aftermath of uh, wild fi uh, fires um, such as those of last year alter habitat often um, you know offers less food and ch animal behavior changes bringing wildlife foraging wildlife into neighboring neighboring human 
communities, which creates vectors for many diseases, bacteria, viruses, and parasites. Bolsonaro is also um, pushing to open indigenous lands and conservation units for mining and agribusiness, policies which greatly benefit land grabbers. The escalating deforestation that worsened by climate change, growing droughts and fires, heightened the risk of the emergence of new diseases, as mentioned, you know, along with epidemic, uh, uh, epidemics such as uh, existing ones, such as malaria. In Peru, the lack of proper systems in place has had a great impact. Vulnerable communities lack water and health provisions, especially in marginalized areas, let's say outside of Lima, outside of cities, and also in rural communities. Migration from Ecuador, all the way from Ecuador through the um, Santiago and the, and the Morona River have also spread the virus in the nation, in the One Piece indigenous nation. Overall, indigenous people have closed down their borders. And in some communities, people that live along the rivers have decided to keep remain isolated in the forest areas. Mariluz from the Kunkama uh, Women's Federation was locked down in Iquitos, Loreto province. She could not go back to the village, she said. They need access to medical assistance, better communication, things like a computer, mobiles, access to the internet. And for communities, self-sufficiency is primordial, getting back to produce their own sustenance. And meanwhile, like in other parts of the world, nature is getting a break. Those are the positive impacts. With Almost two months of quarantine due to coronavirus and isolated humans, the rivers flow without human intervention. And the la landscapes have flourished throughout the country. A drone, drone has captured from the air the tributaries that now breathe uh, a truce and, and full of life. The Rimac, some of you know Lima, the Rimac River has improved in, in different areas of Lima as well as the Chillon River, previously flooded with garbage. According to the National Water Autor Authority of ANA of Peru, construction waste in these channels has been reduced to 80%, and the same occurs with other rivers. In Chile, in the Maipo uh, River Canyon, the Alto Maipo Hydro um, project complex consisting of two dams, Las Lajas and uh, Alfalfa 2, construction continues. That means trucks continue to come from the outside and that has meant that in places like San Alfonso, very small uh, town where many of our partners live, um, they've seen a fierce outbreak of the virus. Chile has also suffered a tremendous drought in the past 20 years or so. And it seems inevitable then that the canyon of Maipo will dry up. And it is in this context of pandemia, climate change and water scarcity that projects based on hydro resources continue. Although perhaps not yet approved or not approved, they continue to move forward such as the, uh, the it, it's like an hidrovia uh, that goes from the southern part of Chile to Atacama. Um, there is another project also, the submarine hydro of the north of the country, um, that uh, also brings water from the south, would bring water from the southern uh, rivers in Chile to up to the north. All this for agriculture and also to supply water to some communities. But uh, both of these projects um, have also been gotten, have received uh, um, the criticism of environmentalist communities and scientists insisting that the water cycle needs to be protected and respected, which includes the forests and wetlands of the basins of these rivers. In the Chilean Patagonia, tourism business has suffered a, a deep decline, but the rivers, the beautiful Futaleufu, the beautiful Baque, the Pueblo, just such immensely beautiful rivers, they continue to, to flow. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has lighted failures of many governments to care for people and life on the planet. And it's also demonstrating a failure once more of the model of economic development. Important is to denounce the negligence of governments and also to intensify support for communities, local movements. And it's through partners such as uh, Fundo Socioambiental Casa in Brazil that it's possible to ensure funds reach the communities on the ground that need support. Thank you. Thanks, Monty. Uh, a lot covered there, and um, we're also getting a number of really good questions coming through, so we'll pick those up a bit later. So thank you, Monty. Um, Monty, don't go off screen, because I'm going to come back to you immediately for the next question. What, is, what are some of the solutions that you're, see, you're seeing that you know our partner networks are really getting in behind? Yeah, solutions are for the, mass, the, for the most part long term but the time to act is now, right now. As said before, we need to protect and respect the water cycle. Rivers have the fundamental right to flow freely and reach the ocean, the right to perform essential functions within its ecosystem, the right to be free from pollution, the right to, be, uh, to feed and be fed by sustainable aquifers, the right to native biodiversity and the right to restoration. Without environmental restoration, there is no social restoration. For this, we are collaborating with partners in Brazil, Chile, and Colombia to create permanent uh, protections for, for rivers, similar to the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act in the United States, and to strengthen existing policies. And how do we do this? We examine the existing water and environmental, water environmental laws and uh, look for ways to improve them. Write a permanent river protection law. Review scientific and technical information related to rivers. Conduct, conduct social diagnostic in some river basins. Transform all that information into communication pieces including the knowledge of, of the local communities and, and, and being able to tell their fascinating stories. Um, and also very important to include urban communities. We form coalitions such as the Wild Rivers or Rio Salvajes in Chile, Clean and Free Rivers in Peru, Rios Limpios y Libres. And we work with, uh, with this coalitions to, to protect rivers. Uh, we also engage in the, uh, are engaging uh, communities and movements that are there for the uh, right of water and water quality. And we design together strategies so that the law can get, get approved and is passed in, by large sections of the country. We're also working to protect rivers as having legal entity under the rights of nature, being subject of rights, having standing in court and have guardians to speak for the river. And there is now extensive jurisprudence uh, on this. We have also some uh, possible good opportunities, Chile and Peru both. Um, there's the possibility of writing a new constitution. This is being worked on. There's going to be a plebiscite in Chile coming up, in, I believe it's in October. And if that happens, then we also have the opportunity to write, to work towards writing the rights of nature in both constitutions, uh, build strong arguments. And for example, in the case of Chile, work together with partners there to shoot shut down water privatization, which is a major obstacle for river protection. And as the saints goes, we should never let a serious crisis to waste, meaning that we now have an opportunity to do things that we never thought were possible before. A different approach needs to be taken, something radically new and different, based on principles of social justice, and caring for Mother Earth, restoring desecrated places, caring for sacred places. There are no unsacred places. Thank you. Thanks, Monty. Um, 
just Monty, uh, our panelists probably aren't seeing the rich discussions and the responses that are happening in the chat box. So we'll try and pick up some of those when we come back to the questions a bit later. But thank you everyone and please keep those discussions going because you're obviously all bringing really deep wisdom from where you're standing in the world, where you're working on these rivers. Pai, can you tell us a little bit about solutions that you're seeing and hearing about from the Mekong and Asian region? Thank you. Thank you. As most of the hydropower dams on the Mekong River are built or proposed for hydropower production, so the solution I'm seeing now is, it, is that there is a growing support for just energy transitions, which respect community rights to rivers and natural resources. We are now seeing temporarily halt to the construction of many proposed dam projects on the Mekong River and on tributaries due to the pandemic. The resulting economic slowdown raised question over the future of this project, whether or not they're going to be revived or going ahead with the construction. Many of the hydropower dams in the Mekong are built for export, with Thailand as a key buyer of electricity. But Thailand currently have massive oversupply of electricity, which have been highlighted further with the economic fallout from the COVID-19. Last month, we saw we have more than 80% of energy reserve and average they are around 40 and 50%, meaning that electricity producing that we are producing are not even used for half of them. So why we need to build more hydropower dams and destroy more rivers. So large dams which destroy rivers and people livelihoods in the Mekong region are not needed anymore. The pandemic and slowdown provide opportunity to stop these destructive projects and replace them with more sustainable and equitable energy options. This would offer a further future wave forward for the Mekong River that is both just and environmentally sound. And one last point on the options that I would like to share would be that the strong community and civil society movement are key. Recently, we have had some victories and positive development this year for protecting the Mekong River. One example would be the cancellation of rapid blasting project or the Lan Chang Mekong, the Upper Mekong Navigation Channel Improvement Project that the Thai cabinet announced the cancellation of the project in uh, February. So this is the effort of two decades movement of the local people and allies in the region. So meaning that we are now protecting some 600 kilometer stretch of the Mekong or the upper reach of the Mekong River from canalization and to sustain ecosystem services for communities living along the river. And one last uh, victory that I'd like to share is that there is an announcement of suspension for mainstream Mekong dams by the Cambodian government for at least 10 years, meaning that the Cambodian section of the Mekong River mainstream will be protected for another decade, and which will yeah, allow us more time to work on energy transition and find other better solutions for the earth and for our communities. Michael? Thanks so much, Pai. Sorry, I was getting myself off mute. Um, so rewarding, I'm sure, for many people on this call to hear about those solutions and the, and the real action that's happening uh, from Monty and Pai. Many of you will have followed and been directly involved in many of those struggles. So some of the, some of the wins that we've had recently are just so much a testament to, to the long struggle of international rivers, but more importantly, of our partners, of local communities. Uh, but I, I just want to commend with all of you here, the staff who have really led that struggle for many, many years. And some of the staff who used to lead those struggles are also on the chat. So extend that congratulations to you. Now, this would not be a, an International Rivers event if we didn't have some action for you to do, some really direct, important action to help us to extend our message and to, and to get the change that we need to happen. So, Laurel, I'm going to ask you to put up the link to the action now, and I'll 
quickly talk you through this, but I also encourage you all to click through to the action. And if you feel so um, inspired, please take immediate action and sign on in support of this. So I'll give you a little bit of background and uh, following the event, we'll also make sure you get this link to be able to share it out to your networks. So as, as we've heard, um, today as we're facing uh, the, the real impacts of COVID, but also looking at the opportunities that this pause that the world is facing, uh, this pause gives us opportunity to rethink and to revision how we value our rivers, how we can actually move to protect them for the absolutely critical role they play in, in, our, in our global health in the in the survival of our ecosystems in in the food sovereignty and food security that underpins our our, our human world as well as the natural world um, so the action we've set up is is a general action to seize the moment to see the critical uh, opportunity that we have to realize and revision rivers to have a more resilient and, and regenerated future. Uh, as, as we've talked about, some of the rivers we work on are free flowing, but many of them are significantly harmed by, by dams or by extraction, by uh, expansion of irrigation systems that take water out of, of the river and its, and its aquifers that can all change and particularly we're focusing on on the role of energy and trying to vision a, f a new future for energy provision many of you on this call are deeply part of this already so we really encourage you to, to share this out to your networks as well um, we we want you to sign on and help us to demand a stop to new dam projects to to construction during this pandemic construction uh, can lead to exposure for local communities. The, the COVID uh, cover, if you like, as we've heard about from Monty in, in Brazil is being used to infiltrate into indigenous communities. And we need to see that stopped. Now is not the time to expand and continue these destructive projects. So they do pose, as you all know, as many of you know directly, these dams pose direct impacts on the biodiversity and the ecosystem health of freshwaters and rivers. And uh, whether it's fisheries or a loss of sediment, many of those losses directly affect the local economies of, of communities all up and down rivers um, below and, and uh, above dams. So some of you might have heard though that while there is a pause in some areas while this is an opportunity the hydro industry itself is not sitting uh, quietly uh, just over recent days they've put out their own call for governments for financiers to get in behind their industry and to support it um, we're seeing it potentially having uh, some real death knell opportunities here that this industry, which is so obsolete in so many parts of the world, can actually be moved to much more uh, regenerative, secure, safe and climate friendly renewable energy sources such as solar and wind and uh, storage and battery services, smart grids. It's that future that we want to build and by taking action now you have that chance. So Nick, I think, has put the link there in the chat box. Um, as I said, uh, after this event, we'll send you out an email with that link as well and, and social media. Uh, we'll be getting that through people who are far more savvy on social media than me, so I won't even try and describe it, but you'll be able to uh, send that out through whatever your favorite social media platforms are. So please sign now. Uh, please share it and we'll send the link out to you as well. Okay, uh, I'm going to move straight from that to the other ask, which is um, around our, our uh, fundraiser. Um, as I said at the top, we've been very, uh, very pleased and honoured to, to have received a, a challenge 
grant uh, for this event of $30,000. For every dollar that we get uh, for this coming month through this event and, and subsequently, that will be matched up to $30,000. I'm very pleased to announce, and you can see the link there to that donation page, and many of you following the chat will have seen that the people are already, without having this page up, they're already making those donations. So thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts for that generosity. Um, but what, what we hope is that we'll be able to hit that 30,000 target um, in the very near future. What I would like to do is just announce to where we are up to now, and I need a latest uh, live update from my team. Um, let me know if that is coming through. Uh, so we have a 30,000 goal. We are at, I'm gonna be uh, general here, I think we're at about $23,000 already, which I can't thank you enough for. Nick's just told me we're at 27,000 already. So thank you for all your generosity already. I want to call out some of the names of uh, people who have, who have given that have got us that far already. And it's so exciting to hear this. Um, right up the top, I really want to acknowledge and thank uh, a name that will be many, uh, familiar to many of your longtime supporter of International Rivers, singer, songwriter, a uh, famous artist, again, Bonnie Raitt, uh, was one of the first to donate to this challenge grant. So thank you, Bonnie. Paul Strasberg, Jake Sig, Daniel Wing, Diana Cohn, uh, Jesse Stone, Mary Sweeters, and a number of people from our board or have given directly. Uh, Deborah and Adam have given $1,000. Scott's given. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you for those gifts. It's so important for us, particularly in, in this year of uh, COVID when we know um, so many people are, are struggling with jobs, so many people are struggling with foundations and their endowments. So to give now is, is so much more valuable. And, and again, I can't thank our anonymous donor enough for their contribution for us to launch this, this challenge grant. I also should have said right at the top, and, and, and uh, there's still time to get on this, but the first uh, 35 people who donate more than $100 to us are going to be recipients of Jane Hirschfield's latest book, Ledger, that we've heard the poems from. Uh, we've got a, we'll, we'll be sending out a thank you to you with, with a copy of that book. So that's an extra stimulus to give right now and, and get uh, one of those great uh, copies of Jane's book. So thank you. And thanks, Jane, for that uh, generous uh, gift for us in that sense as well. Um, before I come back to some of the questions, just as a way to, to wrap us up, I know we're at the hour. I'm going to beg that we can go for another 10 minutes so we can close this out strongly. Uh, so I hope people can stay on for that extra time. For those in the States, uh, I hope you have a glass of bubbly so that we can celebrate if we hit this target. Um, uh, for those who are in my sort of time zones or in Asia, we'll have to stick with coffee for now. But uh, please top your glasses if you have them because hitting the, that fun, fundraising target is so important for us. Um, but I will stop there, but don't stop giving. Uh, I'll, I'll just be moving us back to a question and answer. Um, we've got a few questions that uh, the team have pulled from the chat box. Can I start? So I'm going to ask the panel, Jane, Monty and uh, Pi to, to respond here. But Jane, maybe to start, can I ask of you a quick question that, that came up? Um, where do you see the opportunities for a connection between the arts? As, as I said earlier, you know, so many artists are suffering at this time, but so many artists are central to our activist movements, our networks of civil society. You got thoughts on that, Jane? Well, I, I see so much the same impulse in a number of different fields, which is we want to serve. Uh, scientists, research scientists want to serve, activists want to serve, artists want to serve, because 
all these activities begin with a kind of fundamental awareness, which is the two-step awareness of, first of all, um, a thirst to know reality as it is, to know the materials of the world for what they are, to see first without preconception, without fixed ideas, and to feel fully, which is part of how art contributes, is, is it brings the emotions to the forefront of, of our response to things, um, to feel in that interconnection, what can we do to allow reality to express itself in some different changed new way, which would recognize more the values of interdependence, uh, the, the living independent river with its own rights that Monty so eloquently described. And when you come to this as an artist, first of all, I am grateful to be able to donate myself to people who can do um, a more hands-on and practical world changing. Uh, what the arts can do is partly a preparatory tilling of the field, which might some experience of knowing the world through a poem or a painting or a piece of music might open the heart enough that a person sees a new way of being, a way more devoted towards the whole and perhaps less restricted to um, the illusion of some private good which is not shared by all. Um, art can also, it, it always creates a kind of alloy of, you know, no poem is only grief or despair or only joy. It is always seeing the world with both hands and 360 degrees. And that's very helpful, I think, for us to understand that there are many ways to inhabit our lives. Um, the last thing that I want to say about this is that art is always a practice of creative imagination and freedom. And what that brings to the table is the enormously necessary sense of agency. You know, when we look at the world and see its woes and see the, the, uh, the sacred abiding within the, the desecration, which doesn't really exist, but sometimes can look like that pretty, pretty strongly, the preservation of a sense of agency, that there is always another possibility, another way to see things, another way to say things, um, that is something that I find art contributes to our human lives. Thanks, Jane. I, I think that I'm sure that speaks so much to, to what we're doing in our movements as well, that um, these things are interwoven and they, the more they are interwoven rather than put into boxes, I think the better. Thank you. Uh, Pai, can I jump to you. There's been a number of questions about the Mekong. Uh, I'll just, two aspects of it. One was, um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, with COVID and, and the context of uh, new renewables, is dam building stopped on the Mekong or is it slowed? And the second one specifically to, can you tell us a little bit about what China's doing in the Mekong in that context? in a couple of uh, minutes at best. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. Actually, I, I mentioned already during uh, the, the second part that the, during the COVID-19, the construction of uh, most of the hydropower projects has been on halt, but we are but still uncertain whether or not this project going to be revived because the decline of electricity needs in the region. So that won't, won't justify the construction of these dams anymore. And on the on the opportunity of the of the working to protect the Mekong River from hydropower construction, whether or not in China by Chinese company or in downstream by Thai or Vietnamese companies. I'm seeing that the the, the trend is that they are growing understanding and public support to the movement. We have seen more and more media coverage on the voice of the local people that are affected by the hydropower construction. And I think the one, one key point that 
the locals have been trying to explain to the world, to the society, to, to the policymakers that there are multiple uses of the river, not only the Mekong, not only the Salawin or Tributaries, but elsewhere in the world. There are farmers, fishers, women, children, elders that use these chair resources in different ways, but the way that the river have been used or looked at and grabbed as a single use natural resource like for hydropower or for large scale navigation, that excludes millions of people from these pristine resources and it is even more crucial during the time of COVID-19. So I think that's my two minutes. Thanks, Pai. Yeah, the, the importance of integrated water management is so clear and when one uh, sector dominates it so many suffer uh, and and often thousands of kilometers away such as in the Mekong Delta thank you uh, Monty can I can I throw one last question to you um, there's a question specifically about has has the uh, COVID-19 uh, contributed to an increase in violence an increase in risk for communities uh, that we work with is there an increase or a decrease in the conflict in the context of COVID? The violence, it's always present, has been present since I started working in the Amazon in the 80s, uh, has been increasing and uh, through COVID it continues to, to be. And uh, just to mention one case, one of our partners was killed in Peru in the midst of COVID, right? Uh, so that, yeah, that hasn't stopped that, you know, and the risk, you know, just thinking, for example, just picture, picture um, trucks entering an area of a canyon, you know, here are the glacial, glaciers and trucks coming in from the outside without any protection. That's also another way of um, you know, imposing on communities um, and you know, passing out the virus. You know, so it, it happens in different ways, but it continues to happen. Thanks, Monty. Yeah, and, and that will keep playing out uh, in different ways in different regions as well. Um, one of the things I forgot to say, which, which uh, uh, participants might be interested in, but one of the things we did quite early on in COVID and we're still uh, uh, doing as a response is re reaching out with a specific survey to our partners and to the communities we work on to understand their needs, to hear directly on, on what they're doing and the struggles that they're going through right now, but also to understand what they see as the way forward. So we'll be drawing that out in, in blogs uh, on our website in coming periods and looking at ways to share that as well and to get support around those organizations, the civil society groups, the local community-based organizations who really need that support. Um, look, there's many other points, many other questions. I I'm gonna have to wrap us up because we are already way past the hour, but I think what I'd take away is that um, there's obviously a real energy and an and a, and a opportunity for further discussion on some of the topics. We were gonna share a little bit on, on the work that we've been doing on women and rivers. We'll hold that over for, for a coming webinar. Um, we, as some of you know, were planning a second Women and Rivers Congress in, in Asia last month, which we had to cancel for now uh, because of COVID. And we'll be ho ho hopefully holding that next year, but in the lead up to that, we'll be holding a number of webinars uh, featuring some of the analysis we've done on the state of, state of the basin in the Mekong in this context uh, around the situation for women's leadership in water governance and women's uh, challenge to break through some of the patriarchal barriers that they face in the systemic marginalization that women face within the formal processes of governance of water resources. So that's one area. Other topics that have come through around looking at the food security aspects, food sovereignty, and the important role that freshwater resources play in that. And of course, climate change writ large, but climate change and the value of freshwater systems of wetlands 
and the positive role of free flowing rivers in, in part of a climate response. So we'll pick those topics up, but we'll have to wait for another webinar to do that. Can I uh, collectively on your behalf, thank the panelists for their presentations. Thank you, Monty, thank you, Pai. Um, and before I thank Jane, I'm actually going to hand back to Jane um, and ask her to give us a final poem and then I'll, I'll round us off and let us all go uh, to our coffees or our uh, champagne or our dinner. Uh, Jane, a, a final poem from you if you still feel the, the passion for that. Well, I feel uh, the passion for this work and the way I feel every time I uh, have any, any communication with the uh, staff and people and ideas and eloquence of international rivers or just even think of what it is you are doing on all beings behalf. Um, the poem is, is called Optimism and it talks about resilience and I meant that word, uh, this is an earlier poem, it, it's from before Ledger, um, but it seemed the right one to end with because when I was writing this poem I was very aware that I was writing it at two levels. One was it was a poem of personal life and of my own need for some resilience at the time I was writing it. But I was equally aware of the resilience of the natural world itself and how what we do with our human choices is not the whole of what restores uh, damaged waters to clean waters. So much of it is the work of the microbes, the work of of the molecules, the work of the fishes, the work of all beings. And so I'll close with this. Optimism. More and more I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs, all this unretractable, resinous earth. Thank you, Jane. That is a, a, a beautiful way to, to finish. Um, so thank you, Jane, for, for the poems from Ledger at the top and please find that book, uh, all of you on this call. There's obviously deep wisdom in it and, and so much of our time. So thank you, Jane, and look forward to meeting in person one day, but thank you for your ongoing support for International Rivers. Uh, thank you again to Pi and Monty, to Daryl, uh, to the team behind the scenes for uh, for running this. This is our first uh, Zoom on this um, on this uh, scale, and uh, at times we've had we had more than 300 people register, uh, and and I think we're still running at about 100 strong now. So thank you all for staying on and and being part of the conversation. Um, I haven't been able to follow it directly, but but it looks like there's been hugely rich. Uh, introductions and uh, information shared through the chat. So we'll be trying to gather that together. As I say, we'll pick up some of the themes in future webinars. Um, we'll be welcoming Daryl on as, as the new ED in coming period. Um, and I really want to direct you back as this thank you slide is showing you um, to two things that you can do to help us. If you haven't already, please share your name into the action. We'll be sharing that out through our networks and we also encourage all of you to share that out through your networks, through social media, through email, and we'll build that uh, voice for a vision in that different future. Um, the second part obviously is to thank you all so much again, who have made those generous donations today. Um, the opportunity is there to keep giving through that Every Action link. Um, I'm just getting some latest and last minute updates on that. So let me update you um, accurately to where we got to. Um, so we've just got another uh, $5.6,000. So thank you all who have contributed. I'm not gonna be able to name you all 
because I can't find the right chat, but know that you're loved and know that we really appreciate your generous uh, gift if you've been able to do that. And as Jane said, there's many ways of giving. Money is so critically important, but also just being part of our network, being able to give and to be part of the global movement for rivers is, is also what, what drives us forward. So thank you everyone. Thanks for staying on well past the hour and uh, hope to see you here again in the not too distant future. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs>